A while ago, I was reading this paper, identifying mislabeled instances in classification datasets. The paper was a really good read, in part because it highlighted a very important problem. You see, it turns out that a lot of these classical datasets that are used for benchmarking contain bad labels. And here are some examples from image classification. It seems that this picture is an example of a motorcycle as far as the label is concerned. And this image over here is supposedly a coat. There's even issues in the well-known MNIST dataset, which is all about recognizing handwritten digits. Now this is of course a problem. If you're gonna be comparing algorithms, you're gonna be basing your comparison on the accuracy, which is based on labels. And if the labels are wrong, well, you might be picking a worse algorithm as a result. And that's why the paper is arguing for heuristics and algorithms that help identify mislabeled instances in your own dataset. And this motivated me to do a little exercise that I'm going to share in this video. The exercise will explore a heuristic to find bad labels. Now we're not gonna be applying this heuristic on a image classification task. We're gonna go for a text classification task instead. But the main thing I would like to highlight up front is that what we're about to do is a really important exercise. You cannot claim to have a useful algorithm if you're basing that decision on invalid data. So let's first discuss the idea behind the heuristic. I'll start with a data set, and I'm going to assume that the data set that I start with is clean. Next, what I'll do is I'm going to take that data and I will make it dirty. Now, the way that I'm going to make the data dirty is I'm going to flip the labels, but not all of them, just some. I might change about 10% of the labels from my training set, and let's say maybe 5% from my validation set. And the idea is that by doing this, I am simulating some bad labels in my data. Now, next what I'll do is I'll just train a machine learning model based on this dirty data. Now, of course, I am only learning from the training data set here, but we can wonder what will happen. You could argue that as long as the noise that I add to my dirty data isn't bigger than the signal that's in my original data set, that maybe this model doesn't change so much. And if that's going to be the case, well, what we might be able to do then is we might be able to say, okay, given that we now have a model, let's compare our original data with our machine learning model. And whenever my machine learning model disagrees with what I see in my training data, well, then if that's the case, then that would be an excellent point in time for a human to look at it and maybe to relabel. Now this approach is relatively general. This will work not just on text data, this will work on tabular data or images. And it's also fairly general. You're free to pick whatever machine learning model you like, as long as you pick one that's relatively accurate. But when you look at this thought experiment, there's a couple of questions that just arise kind of naturally. One of the first questions I have is, well, even when I train my model, I'm still going to get some sort of accuracy number out over here. As in, I have a reported accuracy. And one thing I wonder is, well, there's also an actual accuracy. So one part that I'm interested in understanding is just what's the relationship between these two and how do these settings influence that relationship? Besides this phenomenon, there is this other thing I'm also interested in quantifying, and that is how useful of a heuristic is this? Are we really able to find data points that the human needs to double check if we apply this trick? So let's do a quick benchmark to explore this idea. What you're looking at here is a Jupyter Notebook, and what I'll be doing is I'll be playing around with the out-of-scope intent classification dataset. It's a dataset with 150 examples of 150 intents, and I'll mainly be using it for illustration here. What I've got here is a function that can flip labels for me. A thing to keep in mind is that I'm able to set the percentage of labels that need to get flipped but it's this function that I'll be using in just a moment. From the data frame that I start with, I am generating my training and testing data sets, and I'm also declaring a scikit-learn model over here that can make predictions. 
The model that I'm using is fairly simple. I'm just using a count vectorizer with a logistic regressor, but this model will do for the exercise. Next, what I'm doing is I'm flipping my labels over here. And what I'm doing first is I'm saying, well, let's flip about 15% of all the labels in my train set. And after that, let's flip about 1% of all the labels in my test set. What I can then do is I can train my model and note that I'm training it on my flipped data here. And what I can then do is I can say, well, what's the difference between my reported and the actual accuracy that I measure? And when I print that, it's pretty interesting. The reported train score is about 83%, even though the actual score was about 94. But if I look at the test score, it seems like the difference between what's reported and what actually happened isn't that big. So it indeed seems like we're able to add quite a bit of noise to our training data without seeing a humongous impact on our testing data. That on its own is pretty interesting, but I figured I should do this more in a grid search kind of a fashion. So what I'm doing below here is I'm actually running the big proper benchmark on this. Details of the code aren't necessarily important. I'm pretty much doing the same thing as I was above. But what I'm now doing is I'm looping over all sorts of different values for the train flip probability, as well as for the test set flip probability. The train probability is going to flip from probability 0 to 90%. And for the test, I'm doing it between 0 and 30% of the time. And here's the results of that. Let's start with this chart. On the x-axis, we have the probability of flipping a label in the train set. On the y-axis here, we have the reported accuracy on the test set. These two charts are the same, except that here I am measuring the actual performance on the actual test set, and here I'm listing the reported performance on the flipped data set. So again, let's, let's zoom in on this one. While you're looking at five lines, this line over here, the top one, corresponds to a situation where we don't flip any of the test set weights. The line below corresponds with flipping about 7% or so, and that's what all these different lines mean. The darker the line, the more labels that we are flipping in the test set. And it makes sense too. If I look at the darkest line over here, if I don't make any changes to my training data, there seems to be about a 30% difference between the lightest line and the darkest line. And that makes complete sense because that's exactly what we put into the system. So the pattern that you can make up here is that for as long as we don't flip too many labels in our training data, the main effect on our reported test data is just how many labels are flipped in our test set. If I were to compare that to the actual accuracy though, there's no difference. We really have to flip a lot of weights before we see drastic decreases in accuracy. Now the reason why this is interesting is because it seems like we have a convenient property at our disposal here. What these charts are telling me is that if we only flip a few labels in our train data, then our model will remain relatively stable. And of course, that's for this model, for this data set, et cetera. But I can make the argument in general, as long as the signal in the data set is still there, what the model will just do is it will try to ignore the noise. And in situations where there's just more signal than noise, it does seem that the model is capable of ignoring it. The moment that we start getting more flipped labels though, that's where the signal starts becoming weaker. And this is an interesting observation, at least. And this phenomenon is good to keep in the back of your mind as we're going to be applying this as a heuristic to find labels that are wrong. I'm a bit further down in my notebook, and what I'm doing below here is I'm actually making predictions. So I'm saying, hey, model, uh, make a prediction based on the text that I'm seeing. And what I'm also doing is I'm keeping track of the score that comes out of the model. 
So the model can give this confidence score that's between zero and one. And what's interesting about it is that I can say, well, let's sort the data set based on the certainty that you have. And here's the idea. If the prediction that comes out of the model is really, really certain, and at the same time, there's a difference between the label that I observe and the prediction that I make, then you might be able to argue that something fishy is happening. The model is just super sure about something, and it doesn't seem to reflect what's in the data. Now, of course, the model could make a mistake. It's totally possible that without these labels being flipped, that a high confidence is given even though it shouldn't. But for our heuristic here, we could say, well, if there's a difference between what we see in the data and there's a high confidence, then maybe the highest confidence deserves to be checked first. And that means that we can play a little game now. We can say, well, let's take all the disagreements and let's set a threshold. We could say, well, let's put the threshold on 0 0.8 and then all the confidences that are higher than 0 0.8, those will be reviewed by the user. Another way of saying this is you could say, well, this is kind of like a classification where here we're going to say these are the wrong labels. And from here you can say, well, this is a classification for a wrong label. And for that, I can calculate the precision and the recall. And I can do that both for my training data and for the validation data that I kept separate. And if you properly run that exercise, you can get these precision recall charts. And if I look at this chart, what it's basically telling me, the blue line is the precision, the orange line is the recall, but it's basically telling me that if I set the threshold at like a half over here, that I pretty much have a precision that's close to one. So almost all of these examples are indeed mislabeled. And if I then check how many examples might that be, well, that's about 1,200. So that would give us 1,200 out of 1,745 mislabeled candidates. Now, if you compare that to the test set, which had a different flip percentage, then you do see that we don't have the same precision recall curve. The precision definitely drops a lot quicker here than it does over here. But still, it seems like we get a valid trade-off. If I set the threshold around 0 0.5, then my precision is still around 80%. So what have we learned from this exercise? Well, technically it only says something about this particular data set in this particular setup. But I would argue that bad labels are a valid concern in many data science projects. And if nothing else, I do seem to have a heuristic here that's able to at least alleviate some of the issues here. You are able to maybe find some of the bad labels by using this trick. And the reason why it works is that if you have a machine learning model that's based on data, then the whole point of this model is that it's able to generalize. And if a model is able to generalize, then it's also able to observe when it doesn't align with data. If you're interested in doing this though, there is a little bit of advice that I do wanna give, and that is to keep the model relatively simple. In our example, we're using a very simple model just a count factorizer and a logistic regression, which is great for this use case because the model will favor the signal over to the noise. And if I had a very complex model, odds are that I might end up picking up some of the noise as a pattern. There is a bias variance trade-off here. And in the experiments that I've ran, it does seem that models that are simple are able to pick up the signal just a bit better. And yes, part of this is the fact that I'm running this model on English datasets, but it's a theme to keep in the back of your mind. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this explicitly is because I wrote a little bit of software that allows you to do this for Raza data and Raza pipelines. If you go to the typo project on GitHub, you'll find a couple of tools that will help you maintain good quality data for your Raza project. One of the main features is it allows you to augment data for spelling errors, but there is also an API that allows you to confirm whether or not your labels are accurate. The way it works is you're able to pass along a pre-trained Raza model, and you're also able to give it a nlu.yaml file, 
And when you run the command, you will get a CSV file with scores of examples that you might want to double check. You can go to the API documentation for a more elaborate explanation, but it's just a command line app that you can run locally on your machine. I would certainly be interested in getting any feedback that you might have on this tool, because at Raza, we are always investigating tools that make it easier for you to maintain a high quality data set to learn your models on.